Welcome to the 3C Live Experience, a dynamic, multiracial, fast-growing church with thousands of believers filled with passion for God and for people. Let's join 3C in this live experience. Now we're going to get into the Word of God, and if you're ready to receive from the Lord, just take out your books and your Bibles and your pens and your iPads, your iPhones or whatever, and please just be seated, you know, take your seats and relax and get ready for the Word of God because I know that you're going to be encouraged, I know you're going to be touched, and you're going to be challenged by the Word of God today. Now, our text for today is from Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12. And uh, as we get into the Word, uh, our text is Matthew 6 and verse 12 and says, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. The title of the message is Forgive Us Forgive them. Say that with me. Forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive them. Forgive Come on, them. one more time. Forgive us. Forgive, us. forgive them. Forgive you them. see, we need forgiveness, and then we also need to forgive. And I'm going to be speaking about those two aspects of forgiveness. Not only do we need forgiveness for our own sins, but the Bible says that we also need to forgive. In actual fact, the Bible says if we want to receive forgiveness from the Lord, we also need to forgive those that have sinned against us and that have sown destruction within our lives. And with many people that I deal with, you know, over the years, the one thing I've found that people fall into either one of these categories or even both, needing forgiveness or they need to be forgiven. When I look at people's mess they find themselves, the distress they find themselves in, uh, the uh, destruction they find themselves in, a lot of it has to do with forgiveness. The fact that you need forgiveness within your own life, but also needing to forgive others and to release others of the destruction that they have sown within your life. But um, when Jesus prays, you know, for forgiveness. He teaches his disciples to do the same. You know, so often we're so overwhelmed when we pray. We start our prayers with, you know, Heavenly Father. And the first thing we say is, Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me. And I want to bring a balance to that because in asking for forgiveness, we can be so selfish and narcissistic. You see, it's the first thing we pray. Why? Because we make the forgiveness about us even to the degree that we ask for forgiveness, but we still carrying offense against others. We want God to forgive us, but we don't want to forgive others. Now, my question is, is, is it possible then to receive the forgiveness of the Lord if we don't really have that type of faith? If we look at the Lord's prayer when Jesus prayed, you know, that's how he prayed. He started off and said, our Father who art in heaven, he, hallowed be thy name. The first thing he did was bringing praises to the Lord. The first thing he did was uplifting the name of the Father, giving glory to him. And then the first thing that he prayed was about was the will of God. So once again, not narcissistic. He said, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done as it is in heaven. Let it be on the earth. So it's establishing the dominion of God first. Seek first the kingdom of God, the dominion of God, all these things shall be added unto you. You see, so even within us asking for forgiveness, sometimes we can become uh, a little bit selfish. And then the question is, is there really forgiveness? You see, so we've got to understand that if there is no faith, there isn't forgiveness. We've got to have faith. We've got to have faith in the love of God. We've got to have faith in the, in the uh, mercy of God. We've got to have faith in the grace of God towards us for us to receive that forgiveness. So we see that he says, your kingdom come, your will be done. As it is in heaven, let it so be on earth. And then he prays the next thing and he, and he prays, um, give us this day our daily bread. And he prays for the resources needed for what? To accomplish the purpose of God. Give us that which we need today, Lord, to be able to do that which you want us to do. We still haven't made it about us personally, about our sins. You see, that's what happens when guilt comes. We can so easily make it the thing 
And then when we ask for forgiveness, all we want to do actually is just get rid of the guilt because we don't want to feel bad. So, you know, we we want to get rid of the guilt and get God's forgiveness so that we can feel good about ourselves rather than trusting the Lord for a total change. And that's what I want to touch on today, to understand the balance of forgiving us and forgiving them. See, the objective when asking for forgiveness is true repentance, is true change taken within our lives, not just uh, being absolved from our sin, not our sin just being covered. But as we read in 1 John 1 verse 9, that the Bible says, if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God doesn't just forgive. God also cleanses. He changes us. He transforms us on the inside. And that's why David specifically asked God in Psalm 139 and verse 23. He said, search me, O God. He says, and know my heart. Search me, Lord. Search me and know my heart. Try me. Know my anxieties. And see if there be any wicked way within me. And then he says, and then lead me in the path everlasting. So go through my heart. Judge my heart. Lighten up every dark space in my my life. Bring it to the fore so that I can deal with it. See, it's not just about being absolved and our sins being covered. But it's also about true change so that we can become what God wants us to be and fulfill His mandate and His purpose. And that's why we've got to deal with those arguments. You see, God reveals our sin through His Word and through the working of the Holy Spirit so that we can come before God and get that revelation of where we are at so that we can deal with our issues, we can deal with those arguments so that we can be free to be that which God wants us to be. And that's why he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says there, our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So we need to deal, and look, I'm not going to preach on this. This is, I know, this is a whole, this is a whole sermon in itself. I just want to take this point out of it, that we need to deal with the arguments when it comes to confessing our sin and acknowledging it, we need a revelation from God as to understand why we are. What is the motive? Why did we do what we do? Why did we get to where we're at? We need a revelation of where we are at so that God can help us so that we don't get there again, so that we have revelation, that our eyes are opened so that we can become everything that God wants us to be. Therefore, repentance is not merely being sad about your sin and being sorrowful and crying about it. No, we want real change. Real change needs to take place. And then what do we do? We receive the forgiveness of the Lord in faith. We receive the forgiveness of the Lord in faith. Now, please bear with me. I'm just giving you this introduction of God forgiving us because I want to spend a more time on forgiving them because that's where the revelation of the true change takes place. It's not in the forgiving us, but rather as we have been forgiven, we can forgive others and demonstrate the love of God. But Romans 8 verse 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And therefore, you know, as we accept the forgiveness of the Lord. We are rid of guilt, yes, but we are rid of condemnation as well. And we can walk in the purpose of God for our lives. And therefore, I want to encourage you, as you receive the forgiveness of the Lord in faith, as you've received the revelation, so not just 
Oh Lord, I've sinned. Please forgive me. No, no, no. It's that when we pray and we come before the Lord, having a lifestyle of repentance, having a lifestyle of God, you know, checking our hearts, whether we feel guilty or not, we are guilty. None of us live 100% according to the purpose of God for the day every day. None of us are that perfect. So you're guilty whether you feel guilty or not. And many people, they don't feel guilty because they did one thing or two things. It's not about feeling guilty. It's about coming before the Lord every day and asking God to help us that we might be accurate concerning the things of God in our lives. You see, when we talk about holy living, holy speaks about the accuracy of God, about hitting the mark because sin is missing the mark. You know, so we're talking about holiness, the purity, the accuracy, uh, the, uh, being circumspect, walking in understanding, knowing what the will of God is for our life. You see, that accuracy to get to that place every day in our lives, there needs to be a place of, of, of repentance and a place of asking God to forgive us. But I want to add to that, and that's actually what I want to spend some time on, is Lord, forgive us our sin, he says, our trespasses or our debts as we forgive them their trespasses or their sins. Matthew 6, 12, forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14 to 15 says, but if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. You see, forgiveness is so important. We've got to understand that if we want forgiveness within our lives, we have to forgive people their sins as well. Mark chapter 11 and verse 25 says, And whenever you stand, if you have anything against anyone, the Bible says, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you. So, so critical. In our community, vengeance is often seen as something that commands respect standing up for yourself, that macho attitude, right? Especially with the men, you know, fighting for yourself, standing for yourself. But, you know, every day we see that this vengeance and this human wrath is displayed wherever we go. We have road rage. Uh, we have uh, murders. We have uh, blatant executions taking place where people would we'll just take somebody, just get out of a car, walk over a road, take a gun, shoot somebody, jump back into the car. The, 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 the uh, drive-by shootings that we have seen in these last couple of weeks where people are just executed, where people are just taken out. And look, I'm talking about the worst of the worst, but you know, that filters over into things like, you know, Twitter, where we have this Twitter mob shaming people and we think we're awesome when we shame somebody. Now, it might not be murdering somebody, but the Bible says it's the same spirit. No wonder many people are so caught up with guilt and depression and, and bitterness and other destructive emotions. Forgiveness is not an easy subject. It's... The age that we're living in is, is quite a complex age and it's become fashionable these days to speak about forgiving oneself and uh, often an excuse to rather deal with the issues and the guilt that you are going through. And, and often we start laying the blame elsewhere. We're blaming our parents, we're blaming our grandparents, we're blaming our ancestors, we're blaming the government and, uh, and we're blaming society as a whole. Yet there is a natural sinful tendency for all of us to minimize our sins and magnify the blame of others, to treat ourselves with mercy, yet demand retribution against others. If we would only learn to be more repulsed by our own sin than we are at the wrongs others commit against us, we would well be on our way to the road of spiritual health. On the one hand, we urgently need forgiveness. On the other, we desperately need to forgive. 
When we are on the receiving end of mercy, we naturally esteem forgiveness of, as one of the highest virtues that we need. But when we are the aggrieved party, then forgiveness seems to be a gross violation of justice. Who among us does not desire to be forgiven when we know we have done wrong? We all want forgiveness. And who does not despise injustice, particularly when the injustice has been done against you? So what about seeking justice? When we talk about justice, it is natural. It is, it is even right to want to see justice fulfilled and divine vengeance administered. But for the Christian there is another priority. Justice will come. Justice will come. And it will be godly justice, not earthly justice. Justice will come. But in the meantime, our thoughts and our actions need to be, uh, uh, need to be towards others driven by mercy. As Christians, we need to be obsessed with forgiveness and not vengeance. When we refuse to forgive, we elevate our pain and resentment above the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, above the blood and the price that Jesus paid for our sin. And the moment we separate ourselves from the blood of Jesus, our prayers will not be answered and our sins will not be forgiven. And that means our entire life goes into pause. That's it. Your life stops. Even if we continue our normal daily routines and life spiritually, absolutely no growth is taking place. You see, without the blood of Jesus, we carry the full weight of every sin that we have committed. We are personally responsible for paying the debt. We are personally responsible for paying the debt and carrying the guilt of everything that we did. Every day we spend in offense is a day that is wasted. Zero productivity, zero sustainable, godly multiplication. And unfortunately, I've seen so many people struggle within those areas. I've seen so many people go to their grave with hatred and bitterness and disappointment and discouragement. And even many leaders and pastors I've seen over the many, many years of ministry, I've experienced pastors that started off on fire, pastors that, that uh, were preaching the gospel, uh, leaders that were preaching the gospel, great men and women that were preaching the gospel. But at some time within their life, they were wounded. They took offense and they died with that hurt and that pain and that offense within their lives. It is crucial that we deal with offense immediately on a daily basis. Remember, this is the Lord's prayer. It's a daily prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Daily, we need to deal with unforgiveness and offense within our life. Now, some might think forgiveness seems to indicate weakness, but the Bible teaches exactly the opposite. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12 says the following. It says, hatred stirs up strife, but listen to this, but love covers all sins. I used the word all. What word did I use? All. Love covers all sins. I read it again. Hatred stirs up strife. Hatred stirs. You see, even where there is no manifest occasion for strife, yet hatred seeks the occasion. Hatred is looking for an occasion. H hatred will take a peaceful situation or it will take a good situation and is, is looking for a place to, 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 to stir. And hatred does the devil's work. And what we have is malicious, ill-natured people that take pleasure in stirring through gossip, creating evil suspicions and misrepresentations, uh, uh, blowing up the, 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 the sparks of contention causing strife at which with great pleasure they sit and watch and when they see the strife, warm their hands and take pleasure in seeing the strife created. Remember, there is no relationship without forgiveness. We need the forgiveness of God within our lives, first of all, personally, to deal with who we are. And then once we have received the forgiveness of the Lord, freely we have received, freely we now can give forgiveness to other people's life. And it's all because of the blood of Jesus. Freely we have received, freely we can give. Now, I like 
what the Bible says about Peter. We see that Peter came and he addressed the subject of forgiveness with the Lord quite a few times. And we see that Peter had an issue with his temper. He had an issue with anger. And he had an issue with forgiveness. And that's why he came to the Lord in Matthew 18 and verse 21. And it says, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? How often do I need to forgive? Now, obviously, he had some issues. Um, and he asks seven times. Now, you must know he's been sitting under the teaching of Jesus for quite a while. So he's trying to be, you know, he's trying to be quite spiritual. That's why he asks seven times. Because think about that. Seven times uh, being forgiven seven times in a day for the same offense. I mean, that is, that is, uh, that takes some, that takes some doing. So uh, Peter thought he was quite spiritual in asking Lord seven times because, you know, he had heard, you know, the, the ministry of Jesus that we need to forgive. And, you know, he remembers the time where Jesus says, okay, if someone slaps you on the cheek, then what do you do? You turn the cheek again, so slap once and slap twice. And obviously the reason uh, uh, Peter was asking this, you know, he obviously had a few issues with some people. Um, I'm sure he had a few issues with the other disciples. But I mean, this guy, this guy had some issues. Remember when they, 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 they were, came to take Jesus away, he was the guy who took out the sword and he swung it and cut off the guy's ear. And believe me, he was not aiming for the guy's ear. He was going to take the guy out. That's the type of person he was. And by accident, he only got the ear and thank God that Jesus came and, and he was able to, you know, take care of that situation. But, but, but Peter had issues. He had anger issues. And here he's asking, trying to be spiritual in the flesh. So he's saying, Lord, okay, I understand, right? Okay, forgive, yes, I need to forgive. How many times have we forgive? Okay, you mentioned, okay, forgive once. Okay, now, okay, the cheek. Okay, slap, slap. Okay, so that's twice. Now he thinks, okay, well, let's be all spiritual and let's use the number seven, which is the number of perfection. And he says, well, okay, well, is it seven times? Is seven times enough? Because when I do seven times, then I take the dude out. So he's asking, he's asking Jesus. He's asking, I, 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 need, I need a number. And what does Jesus say to him? Jesus says, not seven times. He says, but 70 times seven. Now, obviously, it's not 490. It's not about the specific number for giving somebody 490 times, you know, within the day. It's not about the number. What Jesus is saying is that every time somebody comes and asks for forgiveness, the Bible says you have to forgive them. And that's why Luke 17 and verse 3 says, So watch yourselves. If another believer sins, rebuke that person. And if there is repentance, forgive Listen to verse four. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day and each time turns again and asks forgiveness, the Bible says you must forgive. You see, so it's not about a numerical amount. What Jesus is saying here, you know, that every time forgiveness is asked, we are called to give and to show forgiveness. So what are we saying here today? Forgiveness is, is an act of your will. It's not an emotion. You see, it's by faith. Faith is a decision. It's a decision that you make. And therefore, I want to read Luke chapter 6 and verse 27. And let me tell you, if this doesn't challenge you, nothing will challenge you. This is extremely challenging. Luke chapter 6 and verse 20 says, it says, but I say to you who hear, he says, love your enemies. Do good to those who, who hate you. Did I say that? Yes. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. And then he says, and pray for those who spitefully use you. My goodness, that is incredible. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. And bless those who curse you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. Look at verse 29. It says, to him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other cheek as well. They strike you on this cheek, give the other cheek as well. The Bible says, and to him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic. Either. If they take the shirt, give them your jacket, right? 
If they steal your cell phone, like I said before, say, hang on, hey, you forgot the charger. Once again, if they take your shirt, give them the jacket. This is what the Bible is saying. He says, give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, he says, do not ask them back. Listen to verse 31. And just as you want men to do to you, you need to do to them likewise. Let me tell you, this is Christianity. This is Christianity normal. You want me to take a little bit further? Let's go a little bit further. Verse 32. It says there, but if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. So as a Christian, there's a higher standard. We've got to understand we have the power of God within us, the ability of God within us, the ability to love. So if you only love those that are nice to you, you only love those that give stuff to you, the Bible says sinners do that but you're a born again child of God. You're a Christian. Verse 33, it says, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. Verse 34, and if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? So you're lending and you're, you, you're trusting to receive back. He says, even the sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But what does the next verse say, 35? He says, but love your neighbors, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, the Bible says, and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. In other words, by this you'll be known as children of God. As children, this is what sets us apart as children of God. This is what sets us apart where you can say, I have the living God that dwells within me, the ability of God that dwells within me. Why? I know that He will take care of me, that He will look after me. He's forgiven me. Everything I have is from God, the faith that I have within God. And because He has given me everything freely, I can give away everything I have, I can give freely. Verse 36 says, Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. And then verse 37, it says, judge not and you will not be judged. He says, condemn not. He says, and you shall not be condemned. He says, forgive and you will be forgiven. Verse 38 says, give, listen to this, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, I know we read this verse, you know, when we take up offerings. A lot of churches where I go, they read this verse when they're taking up offerings. But in actual fact, you know, there's no reference here to money. The reference is to the heart. So it can include resources, it can include money because it says, it says the following, it says there, uh, give and it, it, it will be given back to you. In other words, that which you sow will be multiplied back to you. As you are sowing finances, it will be multiplied back to you. As you're sowing your time, it will be multiplied back to you. As you are sowing uh, love, it will be multiplied back to you as you are sowing uh, 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 hope, as you are sowing mercy, see, that will be multiplied back to you. And then it says how it will be multiplied. The more grace you show, the more, more, the more mercy you show, it says there, it will be given back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. I'll say that again. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, I'll say that again, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall be put into your bosom. For the same measure that you measure will be measured back to you. And my question to you today is how are we doing when it comes to mercy, when it comes to love, when it comes to showing forgiveness? You see, the standards of God is above our standards. The thinking of God is beyond our thinking. You cannot live like this out of yourself. You cannot live like this 
on your own steam out of the flesh. We need the Holy Spirit of God within our lives. And therefore, I want to close with this. You know, Jesus provides us with a perfect model of forgiveness. To the extent that we are forgiven, we need to forgive. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those that have sinned against us. How do you want to for, be forgiven? Well, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. Seriously? You want God to forgive you the same way? You want a God that forgives you, but remembers everything that you do and keeps a book? The Bible says that when God forgives you, He remembers your sin no, uh, uh, he remembers your sin no more and He removes it as far as the east is from the west. He removes it. So, so He remembers it no more. You see, so, uh, you know, we forgive people and then we say, well, now you must prove yourself. You must prove your trust. God says He remembers it no more making a decision that once you forgive somebody that you're not going to be suspicious, that you're going to trust them because you believe in God. You believe the same God that is working in your life is the same God that's working in other people's lives. You believe that the same God that rescued you and saved you from the mess that you found yourself in is the same God that is working in every other person's life. So our faith is not in people. See, but our faith is in God. The same God that is working in me is the same God working with my spouse, the same God working in my wife, my husband, the same God working within our children, the same God working uh, within our neighbours, the same God working within uh, our, our colleagues at work. It's the same God. And therefore, we're not going to be suspicious of everybody, that, but when we forgive, we release, and we make a decision that we're going to trust again. We're going to put our faith in somebody again. How many times? 70 times seven. How many times a day? Seven times a day. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible teaches us. Therefore, I want us to use Jesus as the model. And if we look at his life, even on the cross of Calvary, while he's hanging on the cross, there Jesus is between two murderers, he was innocent. He never sinned, never made a mistake. But there he was. And you know what? Even hanging on the cross, his life wasn't about himself. On the cross, he was evangelizing. On the cross, he was, he was reconciling people to the Father. He was ministering to the two on the side. He was ministering to his mother and to John, taking care of the welfare of his family. And then what else did he do? He forgave those that put him on the cross. And in Luke chapter 23 and 34, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Forgive them, Lord. And it's not that they didn't know what they were doing. They knew they were killing Jesus. But you see, they didn't have a spiritual revelation and understanding of the condition of their lives. And Jesus was saying, Lord, Father, please, please forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And that's not the only time in the Bible where we read that. We read that even in Stephen in the book of Acts chapter 7 and verse 60. We see that they were stoning him because he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And while stoning them, he says the following in Acts 7 verse 60 in the New Living Translation. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge them with the sin. Don't charge them with the sin. And the Bible says, and within, with that, the Bible says he went into a sleep and the Bible says, and he died. You see, so you've got to understand that he looked his murderers in the eyes like Jesus. He looked his murderers in the eyes and he didn't say, well, God's going to get you. The Father is going to, oh, if you, if you just knew. That's not what it was about. It was, there wasn't vengeance in the eyes of Jesus. There wasn't vengeance in the heart of Stephen but rather there was a love and there was forgiveness. And that's the type of forgiveness that we need within our lives. As humans, we do not have the capacity to forgive people when they destroy our lives. And I'm not talking about, you know, childishness where, you know, I've got a grudge because, you know, 
you know, auntie never greeted me or, or, or uncle, you know, said this. I'm not talking about play, play things. We live in a life uh, style within our nation where we experience violence on a daily basis. There's hardly anybody in this country or even on this continent that has not gone through some aspect of violence where we've had a loved one being hurt uh, and we've had people uh, pass on and people being hurt through violence. And it's not experienced at once. Many of us have experienced it a few times over and over. So we understand. I'm talking about real destruction within your life where people have gone out to hurt you, to destroy you, to kill you to take your money, steal your money, destroy your business, that have gone out to bankrupt you, gone out to hurt you. They've sat and planned for days, planned for hours to destroy your life. So we're not talking about play play. We're not talking about play play. We're talking about real life, real issues that we have. And what does the Bible teach us? The Bible says that we must not hold the sin against them, but we need to forgive them. And we have the capacity to do that because of Jesus Christ that dwells within us. You see, the flesh never wants to forgive. The flesh wants vengeance. It's only through the supernatural revelation of the cross of Jesus Christ where we say, Lord, you've, given, you've forgiven me. Freely I've received and freely I'm going to forgive. Once again, I read Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us as we forgive them, forgive them their trespasses against us. Forgive us as we forgive them. Forgive us as we forgive them. Forgive us as we forgive them. The measure that we forgive others is the measure of forgiveness that we receive from the Father. And therefore, I want to encourage us. Let's make that decision. Our nation needs healing. There is no healing without forgiveness. There's no healing without forgiveness. And that's why I want to encourage you today. Many of you have been broken for years. But the reason you're still broken is because you won't let it go. You won't let it go. You're hanging on to your bad experience. You're hanging on to those things that you went through, the things that were said, the things that you, the loss that you experienced, whether you're mad with people, blaming people, whether you're blaming God, uh, whether you're blaming the government, whoever you're blaming, at the end of the day, there will be no healing of your heart and healing of your life and your family. There is no healing without faith. And what is the faith element? The faith element is releasing and forgiving others. That's the faith. You want God to heal your heart, you need to forgive. You need to forgive your previous workplace. You need to forgive your ex-husband, your ex-wife. You need to forgive your children that you haven't seen in years. You need to forgive your grandchildren that don't want to talk to you. You need to forgive your parents that are, have never been around, your parents that you have never seen, your parents that left you and didn't want anything to do with you. You've got to forgive that teacher that, that, that hurt you. You've got to let it go. You've got to release it. And it's only when you forgive that healing and restoration takes place. You see, and that's a principle within our nation as well. We're not going to experience the healing of this nation until we take a step of faith and we forgive those that have sinned against us and that those that have hurt us. And you know what? That is a daily occurrence within the issues that we find ourselves within the nation and the, 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 the vengeance and the, the hurt and the things people say and the things that people do. It starts with us. Let's bring healing to this nation. How do we do that? By releasing and forgiving. And you know what? Justice will come. God is a God of justice, but we don't want earthly justice. We want a godly justice. We want a balanced justice, a justice that comes from the wisdom of God. But let's get obsessed as Christians. Let's get obsessed with forgiveness in Jesus' name. This 3C Live experience was brought to you by the 3C Media Production. For more information, call us on 86 or log on to my 3 c TV. Or you could write to us at P.O. Box 10508 Centurion 0046 or email us at tv at my3c.tv. If you need prayer, SMS the word PRAY 
followed by your prayer request to 33347. And our team of prayer warriors will pray for you for 30 days. If you would like to become a partner with the ministry, SMS the word PARTNER to 33347. And one of our team members will get back to you within the next few days. You can follow Pastors Bert and Shanae Pretorius on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to be inspired daily by morning devotions, ministry updates, and much, much more. Log on to my3c.tv for more information.